Well, good afternoon to all of you. I, uh, I just arrived from Tyndall Air Force Base. Uh, the Vice President of the United States said that he wanted to go down to Tyndall, and the answer to that is, yes, sir. Happy to have you come. But he came with a message from the President and from the American people of how proud he is of our airmen, those serving at Tyndall and across the country, and with a message that we will be rebuild Tyndall Air Force Base. You know, it is really amazing, and I, I, you know, I have a rule that any day out of Washington is a good day. And it was a good day to be with Colonel Laidlaw and the men and women at Tyndall Air Force Base and to realize that um, now this is a group of people who over a holiday weekend went from, four, in 48 hours, not even a named tropical storm to a Category 4 plus hurricane, evacuated 11,000 people and hundreds of millions of dollars of equipment without a single injury or death. And now they are recovering that base to operational capability. I live a blessed life to be serving with all of you, and I couldn't be more proud. So congratulations to all of you and to the Airlift, Airlifter, Airlift and Tanker Association on its 50th anniversary. 1968, that was the year of the second largest American airlift operation, Operation Niagara. The United States Air Force, the Navy, and the Marine Corps flew over 24,000 tactical and strategic sorties during the 11-week siege of Quezon. This year is also the 70th anniversary of the largest airlift in American history, the Berlin Airlift. We've been doing airlift and refueling for a long time. And since this is a history and heritage theme for this conference, let's, let's look back for a moment and celebrate some of our heritage as airmen. I want to tell you about one airman whose name may not be familiar to all of you. His name was Hugh Nur. Much like Billy Mitchell, Hugh Nur was a true believer in an independent Air Force. Now, 100 years ago, Billy Mitchell emerged from World War I as a proponent of strategic bombing and of an independent Air Force. He was inspired by Hugh Trenchard, the father of the Royal Air Force, and Italian air theorist Giulio Duhay. Mitchell believed that striking an adversary's ability to resource the war effort would end wars faster. In the Battle of San Miguel 100 years ago this September, Billy Mitchell led nearly 1,500 American and Allied airplanes over enemy lines to destroy German military and industrial targets, helping to bring the First World War to an end. Mitchell and Duhay were impatient for an independent Air Force, and both of them ended up being court-martialed for insubordinate behavior. In America, Billy Mitchell had a lot of followers, and among them was Hugh Neuer. Hugh grew up in Atchison, Kansas. He was the son of a doctor. And in the summers, he would visit his grandfather in Dayton, Ohio. And he earned a few pennies sweeping the floor of a popular bicycle shop run by Orville and Wilbur Wright. He graduated from the U.S. Naval Academy in 1908, and he earned his pilot's wings in 1917. As a captain, he earned a reputation for being a troublemaker. He was an independent thinker with vision and energy. And in 1927, General Mitchell put Major Neuer 
in command of the 2nd Bomber Group at Langley Field, where his creativity could shine. Noor quickly realized that open cockpit bombers wouldn't survive in the future of combat. And he thought he needed two designs, one for day and one for night. The Army General Staff rejected his request, but he was relentless. His vocal pursuit led to the Martin B-10 and eventually to the B-17 Flying Fortress. Nur said that success in war depended on the success of the Air Force. And the success of the Air Force was a direct consequence of its own logistics elements. He used his time in command to anticipate the need for logistics and agile basing. He wrote words at the time that still ring true today. He said we should boldly face the fact there are going to be no facilities, no aerodromes, no gas trucks, no lights, nothing but the bare hands of the ship's crews to exist within striking distance of our enemy. We must build up a system of supply that will work under conditions of extreme dispersion. You could have written that today. He said that moving men and supplies was the Achilles heel of any Air Force and must be moved quickly by air, not by ground or sea. Neuer conducted exercises to prove his concept that air transport was faster, relied less on stored inventory, and was the kind of flexibility that was needed to win. He set up a system of depots for moving parts and supplies that was the first of its kind and was adopted permanently by the United States Army. In 1943, General Hap Arnold sent Colonel Nur to Europe to fix the logistics problems that they were having there. He became a one-star general and reorganized Headquarters 8th Air Force around two deputies, one for operations and one for logistics, putting logistics on par with operations for the first time and under the control of one commander. By 1944, Noor was promoted to two stars and put in charge of moving all the men and supplies in preparation for Operation Overlord and the invasion of Normandy. Operation Overlord was successful in no small part due to Hugh Neur's leadership. Later, General Hap Arnold wrote Neur a personal letter, and he said, the contributions of your command represent one of the greatest ever to be made in the history of aviation. Aircraft doctrine began to take shape after World War II as strategic and tactical airlift became separate entities. About three years after World War II, the Berlin Airlift marked the first time that air power was used for diplomatic pressure. It brought together the best things we learned in Europe and from flying the hump in the Himalayas. From the early days of creating airlift doctrine to conducting medical evacuations under fire and developing glo global tanker capabilities, the Air Force has been a dominant force for our sister services, our allies, and our nation. So where are we going next? What can all of you expect over the coming decades? Well, first and foremost, air refueling is a no-fail mission for a global power. The KC-46 earned the Federal Aviation Administration's final airworthy or airworthiness approval last month. The final certification, the Air Force's military airworthiness approval, is the next step. 
And then the first aircraft can be delivered to McConnell Air Force Base in Kansas. We are committed to delivering a world-class refueling capability to our warfighters while providing American taxpayers a good value for their hard-earned dollars. McConnell and Altus are ready for delivery. The airmen at those bases will take their place in a long history of Air Force innovation to meet the future threat. The National Defense Strategy, promulgated in January, recognizes the reemergence of great power competition as the defining conflict of this decade and beyond. The Air Force, in response to that strategy and at direction of the Congress, conducted an analysis over the last six months to try to determine what it would take to meet the requirements of the national defense strategy. What is the Air Force we need to execute that national defense strategy at moderate levels of risk? That analysis was driven by strategy, not by budget. We use the latest intelligence projecting forward to the 2025-2030 timeframe. We use the current operational concepts that have been developed and refined by the Joint Staff over the last two years. And we did more than 2,000 simulations against strategic competitors. The Air Force we need in the 2025-2030 timeframe will need more tanker squadrons. In fact, our analysis says that we will need 14 more tanker squadrons than we have today. We will also need some more strategic airlift and a, and a little bit fewer tactical airlift squadrons, but overall, logistics will continue to be a key element of winning war and projecting power. We are not naive about the financial choices that the nation faces. But we owe, as airmen, to our countrymen to tell them what is needed to defend the nation. The National Defense Strategy makes building a more ready and lethal force the top priority. Last spring, the Air Force brought together about 50 airmen from all around the world to really get beyond just the major elements of readiness and give us a clear plan forward to restore the readiness of the force. We put those 50 airmen in a windowless room in the basement of the Pentagon and told them they were not going to be released until they had a plan. It took about six weeks. And they produced a plan for readiness recovery that we are following. One of the things they decided to focus on were the operational squadrons, the fist of power in the American Air Force. Now, to be sure, without the weight of the body behind the fist, the fist is nothing. But if we focus our effort on restoring the readiness of the fist, we align everything else in the Air Force towards what really matters, which are the operational squadrons and their readiness to fight. We have 312 operational squadrons today. In 1991, when the Air Force went to the fight in the first Gulf War, we had 401 operational squadrons. Of the 312 we have today, we've identified 204 of what we call pacing units. And the readiness team identified those because those units are the ones that are most relevant to the high-end fight. And we are focusing our resources and our manpower on those squadrons first. We intend for 80% of those units to have the right number of properly manned, trained, and equipped airmen by the end of 2020. This plan will accelerate readiness recovery of those units by six years. This is the difference between focusing our resources on where it matters most and peanut butter spreading the readiness money that we've received across the entire Air Force at the same time. The remainder 
of the 312 operational squadrons will meet the 80 percent mark by 2023. Years of shortages of parts and budgets that were inadequate I think have made us a little bit accepting, perhaps too accepting and complacent. We've come to think that maybe it's okay to have mission capability rates that are constrained by what we can afford. It is not okay. It is not okay. And as funds go up, we also have to change our own attitudes towards readiness. Improving readiness is up to all of us. All of us have to find a pathway back from crowdsourcing and cannibalizing the United States Air Force located here in the continental United States and rolling forward 10 or 20 percent of our people in onesies or twosies onto mature infrastructure in the Middle East to fight with exquisite command and control in a place where we have air superiority. In the future of warfare, that will not be good enough. We have to reorient ourselves, our readiness, our presentation of forces, our training to be prepared for the great power competition that we face. And if we are prepared, the likelihood that we will have to fight will go down. But let nothing be left to doubt, nothing be left to chance. We are always ready. We are always at the top of our game, and we will always fight for this country. First and foremost, restoring the readiness of the force is about having enough trained people to do the mission. In September of 2016, after the cuts were absorbed that were imposed on the Air Force because of sequester, the Air Force was short about 4,000 active duty maintainers. 4,000 maintainers short. You can't maintain the aircraft if you don't have the trained people to be able to do the job. One of our top priorities with the funds that Congress gave us is to fill those holes. Today, we are only 400 active duty maintainers short, and by the end of this calendar year, that gap will close to zero for our active duty forces. But of course, they're pretty young and we have to season them and get them trained to be craftsmen at their work. But it's not just maintainers. We have a shortage of air crew. In fact, we have a national shortage of pilots and air crew. And the airlines are making generous offers to experienced flyers. We have developed a path to recovery, and we are executing that path. First. The Chief of Staff, Dave Goldfein, and I believe that we have to address the quality of service and quality of life for our airmen and for their families. Things like reducing the operating tempo, revitalizing squadrons, restoring the support positions so that air crew can focus on their primary job. We are funding flying hours and giving airmen greater input on their assignments. And we know that some aviators just want to fly. So Air Mobility Command is testing a fly-only technical track to see if that's a way to retain some of our most valuable assets, which are our air crew. We are also trying to get rid of stifling regulations that are about paperwork and centralized control and not about readiness and lethality. When General Goldfein and I first met just before I was confirmed, we had dinner together and we talked about some of the things that we saw in the service and things we wanted to change. Truth is, Dave Goldfein and I were sworn into the Air Force on the same day in the same place. It is wonderful to be back serving alongside him. But one of the things we talked about was the way the Air Force had become so centralized, centrally controlled in ways that just didn't make sense. You know, we have an Air Force instruction on how to build an obstacle course. 
My guess is if you need an obstacle course at your base, you can probably figure that out. Last summer, I was on my way into a conference in, uh, with the National Guard in Kentucky, and just as we arrived, my military aide came up with a laptop and said, ma'am, before you get off, you need to approve this email. And I said, well, what's this? And he said, well, we've evacuated Patrick Air Force Base in advance of the storm of the hurricane last summer, and they, the rideout team is still there, and, and they're going to ride out the hurricane, but the, uh, the base commander wants permission to take the high water vehicle to his residence tonight so he can re recover the base tomorrow morning, to his residence on base. And I said, uh, why is he asking me? And he said, well, ma'am, there's an Air Force instruction that says that you can't bring a government vehicle to your personal residence as transportation. There is an exception in the regulation for an emergency. And in that emergency, you need the written permission of the Secretary of the Air Force. <laughs> I actually did not, well, I won't share exactly what I said, but I did not believe it. <laughs> it is true. It's written in the regulation that in an emergency, you need the written permission of the Secretary of the Air Force, and it recommends that you start the paperwork 45 days in advance. <laughs> So, so the problem is we're just not scheduling our hurricanes well enough <laughs> to give ourselves, this is nuts. But it's not just annoying, time consuming, and a little bit stupid. The future of warfare that we're preparing all of you for, that we must anticipate, is going to be in an environment where there will not be guaranteed command and control where you may, may not have communications at all, where you may be flying out of a location that 24 hours before didn't even have an airstrip. We expect you to carry out mission orders and get the job done. If we expect you to fight that way in wartime, we have to treat you and train with you that way in peacetime. In the last 11 months, we have rescinded over 250 Air Force instructions, and we're not done yet. So we will try to lift the burden of micromanagement off of our air crew, but doing those things and focusing on retention won't be enough. We have to increase the number of pilots that we're training. We are expanding the training pipeline from a little over 1,100 in fiscal year 17, building to 1,500 pilots a year by fiscal year 22, and steady state thereafter. If we do these things, if we focus on the restoration of the quality of service and quality of life for our airmen, and increase the number of pilots we're training every year, by 2023, we will have recovered from the air crew shortage, and we will have more than 95% of our pilot requirements full. The second most com important component of readiness is relevant and realistic training. We're improving simulators, threat emulators, and training ranges to enhance realism and to enable our airmen to train in a complex, multi-domain combat environment. We could not have done those things without the financial lift that we've gotten from the Congress and the support of the President of the United States over the last two years. And yet, the Budget Control Act remains the law of the land. The most important thing we can do over the next year is to convince the United States Congress that we have to get beyond the Budget Control Act. If we are to go, if the Air Force went through sequester again, it would be devastating and we would lose all of the gains that we have recovered over the last two or three years. The third element of restoring the readiness of the force is weapon system sustainment, the parts, the supply, the equipment, to make sure that our aircraft are ready to go when needed. I don't need to tell any of you that our fleet is getting old and our operations tempo is still high, but we are significantly increasing our spare, accounts apart, count, our spare parts accounts 
and finding new ways to improve logistics and new systems to keep our aircraft flying. Truth is that the acquisition system that we inherited from the Cold War is too slow for the digital age, and it is too slow for the adversary that we face that is innovating faster than we are. To meet the needs of the national defense strategy, we're fielding tomorrow's Air Force faster and smarter. In the last two years, the Congress has restored authorities to the services that help us get improvements to the warfighter faster. And there are a number of ways we're doing this. The first is that we now have new authorities to prototype and experiment. We're building and testing and iterating right away instead of spending two or three years up front trying to analyze all the bells and whistles. And what you have in the end is a stack of paper, but you really don't have engineering understanding from having built something and actually tested it. These prototyping authorities are opening new pathways that just didn't exist before. The Air Force is working with the Navy to prototype a hypersonic boost guide system, and by working together, we're fielding it five years earlier than expected. Five years. Instead of, funding, instead of following a one-size-fits-all development checklist, we're now actually tailoring projects around timelines and milestones for every acquisition project that we do. As an example, we're upgrading our, our, uh, our defensive uh, uh, survivability systems on the F-15. And there was a lieutenant colonel who took our assistant secretary for acquisition at his word when he said, look, tailor the acquisition rules. Not, don't just go by the book. The book says right in the first chapter, tailor this for what you need. And he said, OK. He came in and said, you know, if we split these decisions up, I can do two tailored reviews of my system. It makes more sense for me from an engineering point of view. And it allows me to accelerate the fielding of this system by 18 months at no additional cost. That's smart acquisition. One of our biggest challenges in the Defense Department is software. We are terrible at buying software. We buy it like it's hardware, and it just is not the same thing. So we stood up a new program executive office. It's called PEO Digital, and it's at Hanscom Air Force Base. So they are transitioning software development from a product to a service. They're starting with operational units, going out with software developers, sitting with operators, fielding software programs that are designed for the user and updating them through continuous incremental improvements in days, in weeks, in 30-day sprints. PEO Digital will expand this agile software development practice throughout the Air Force for every piece of software that we buy. We also just recently established a rapid sustainment office to drive down the cost of repairing aircraft. In the first quarter of last year, there were 10,000 requests for parts that said, you know, we need, we need these parts for this aircraft. 10,000 of them for which there was not a single bidder because the parts suppliers are no longer in business, no longer making that part. And if you only need a small number of parts, it's just not, it's just not there's no business case to redo all of your, uh, your machine tools to make those particular parts. But with advanced manufacturing, we don't have to do things that way anymore. So we set up the Rapid Sustainment Office. And they're using advanced techniques like 3D printing. They're also putting sensors to predict parts failure in order to reduce the time that aircraft are down for maintenance. They're making door handles for the back door of C5s. They're making covers that are out of production, out of polymers. And they are doing predictive maintenance on the C5 and the B1 that are reducing time down for maintenance by 30%. We are going to extend these, these techniques and these tools to the entire Air Force. We are using the authorities given to us by Congress, not just because it's faster, 
because it's giving us better results. We're encouraging competition among companies to drive innovation and to spur competitive pricing. Competition works. In the last seven weeks, we've had four major acquisition announcements for the United States Air Force. The GPS 3F, which is the jam-resistant GPS satellites. The replacement for the UH-1 helicopter. The TX jet trainer and launch service agreements. Those four very competitive procurements save the American taxpayer about $15 billion because of intense competition and new ways of doing business and manufacturing that that has provoked. Our B-52 engine replacement program is using what's called digital engineering to maximize fuel efficiency and extend the B-52's range. We recently contracted with two of the largest engine manufacturers in the world to prototype a new engine for us. We didn't set out a requirement. We didn't do analysis of alternatives. We said, see if you can build us an engine that has a 10% increase in thrust and a 25% increase in fuel efficiency. See what you can do. And then we'll decide what the requirements are for the next generation of engines. Imagine for a moment what it means for range, for endurance, for the tankers we need. If we can get a 25% increase, or even close to a 25% increase in fuel efficiency on the Air Force fleet. The United States Air Force spends $5 billion a year on fuel. This is another game changer. Next month, we will host something a little bit unusual and revolutionary. We want to do contracts differently with the Air Force, and we want every company to be able to bring their innovations and do business with the Air Force. Because right now, for small, innovative companies, it's too hard to do business with us. So we're going to set up a day with small business, and we're going to do 50 contracts in 50 hours. And if you've got a, a swipe and a PayPal account that can take a government credit card, you can, you can have a contract with the United States Air Force. And that contract will be one page long. That will open the door to the kind of innovation that we need in the Air Force. We're doing the same kinds of things in space. The Space Enterprise Consortium that we set up in January was open to all kinds of companies, but really focused on getting small and innovative companies into the practice of supplying the United States government and the Air Force. We have over 200 companies that are now involved in this consortium. In the last nine months, we have awarded 32 contracts worth $100 million. And 75% of those companies are companies that have never done business with the Defense Department before. They're the small, innovative companies that are going to drive the future. And those contracts, an average of 93 days from solicitation to award. The Air Force is showing that we can buy things faster and smarter. We have a rich history of innovative airmen adapting cutting edge capabilities from the commercial sector for military use and leading developments later adapted and adopted by the commercial industry. Hugh Noor was doing this as a young officer, driving the development of advanced bombers, transport aircraft, depot supply, and maintenance systems. He took what was known about warfare and used the authorities given to him to make things better. Everything he created was to improve readiness and lethality against a peer adversary. Driven then, as we are today, to compete, deter, and win. In that era, Guillaume Duhay wrote that victory smiles upon those who anticipate the changes in the character of war, not upon those who wait to adapt themselves 
after the changes occur. That was true then and is still true today. As the Chief of Staff of the Air Force, Dave Goldfein, says, don't wait for us. God bless you all, and God bless the country that we love.